It's my uh, great pleasure here today to um, introduce the talk of Dr. Florian Kuhn, who is an assistant professor and senior researcher at Hamburg's Helmut Schmidt University. He's on research leave, however, right now, and is spending that time at Queen's University. Um, and what's the center at Queen's that you're, that you're at? Okay, QCIR, which stands for what again? Okay, Center for National Relations, that works. I should know that. So, now he's one of many German specialists working on Afghanistan. Germany is a real center of gravity for work on Afghanistan. In fact, that's when I started working on Afghanistan, when I was living and working in Germany at a think tank in Bonn. So we're really um, fortunate to have you here today across the Atlantic here to share your impressive knowledge on Afghanistan. And it is impressive. Florian's been working on Afghanistan since 2002. He's done extensive field work in the country. And I'm not going to mention his many publications, but there's an extensive list of publications. And I've known of his work for some time and heard of him. It's not that big a community of people who work on Afghanistan. And I was fortunate enough to finally meet him in New Orleans at the International Studies Association Conference in February, which is when I was very quick to extend an invitation for him to come here to Waterloo since he was so close by. Um, I should say that also that he obtained his PhD in 2009. I think this talk is partially based on that PhD, which was uh, titled Security and Development in World Society, Liberal, uh, uh, Liberal Paradigm and State Building in Afghanistan. So if you could join me in giving a warm round of applause to welcome Florian to the stage here to give us his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for the kind invitation and for the kind words. Um, thanks to all of you for coming here. Um, uh, it's a very cool room. It's probably the, the, the coolest room I had the pleasure to give a talk in, I must admit. So I'm, I'm still quite impressed. So um, I am going to talk about something that is part of my PhD, or was part of my PhD. Um, and it's taking, it's moving a little bit away from the military question um, that we are discussing all the time, basically, when it comes to Afghanistan. Um, and I'm trying to put it more, the whole state-building endeavor into a picture, um, looking at how does that state-building work and how is it financed? Because usually we, we look at institutions and we say, say, okay, we need a government and we need a ministry and then we need someone to run it and then we need experts to, to, to be impartial and, and do the work but we never really look at how we pay for it or who pays for it. Um, so basically that is what I'm going to do. And I've put this picture um, at, the, at the beginning of my talk. As you can see that, I hope you can see it. Um, it's, it's President Karzai. This is a lot, I, I took that picture a lot earlier. Um, that's up in the mountains of the Hindu Kush, somewhere in the middle of, it's not really nowhere, but it's, it's close to nowhere. Um, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the, the, there's a huge centralization in the Afghan state. It's all built around the presidency. Um, and from there develop certain structures um, that I would call clientelist structures. Um, and I'm going to, to talk about that and how it interrelates with how, how it's being financed. Um, so we can say Afghanistan is actually one of the most centralized states in the world if you look at the constitution and if you look at the role that um, the Afghan presidency plays. Um, at the same time, it, is, it used to be and still is socially quite fragmented. Um, you probably heard about all the ethnic uh, groups that are um, based in Afghanistan but there is also a lot of economic grievances between different strata of the society, um, and all that is part of the conflict setting that we find ourselves in. Uh, my argument proceeds such. Um, after a short introduction into the state building, the, the, the course of events, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about state and its economic reproduction. That means, what, what is it that makes a state work in financial terms. Then I'm looking at Afghanistan 
um, and I'm going to look at rents. So we are not taking, we are not talking about pensions, that kind of rents, but it's an economic rent, um, and that's derived from 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 economic science. Um, it's actually a, a, a term used in economic um, discussions a lot, and I'm going to explain what it means. And then I'm going to split it up into one thing that is quite common in literature, that's the idea you have um, recipients of rents um, who are the state elite and who are running the state. So that's what I call the state rentiers. And then there's something that is not so much in literature because um, mainly um, most of it is something that I derive from the state rentier literature is what I would call the drug rentiers. Um, that is, you can actually frame the way that they earn money in a, ron in a, in a rent um, kind of setting as well. Um, then I'm going to talk about the political consequences of that setting and conclude with a couple of words, after, after which I hope we can get into a discussion and um, talk about some of the things that I've raised. Okay. Um, I'm arguing that after 9-11, as you all know, um, the, the legitimacy for intervention in Afghanistan was quite huge. Um, most people understood that there was a security problem um, related to Al-Qaeda's terrorists and that it was important to do something about it in international security terms. Um, so the intervention in Afghanistan um, was uh, highly supported, broadly supported internationally um, and we had all these, these international gatherings about how, how to proceed there. Um, the United Nations Security Council resolution was adopted anonymously, um, and the course of events actually um, run that the, the US supported the Northern Alliance, um, which was fighting the Taliban for a couple of years, but they were retreating, and they were only holding a very small fragment of the country at that time, because the Taliban had actually uh, controlled most of it. Um, so what was happening was there was air support for the Northern Alliance, um, but the fighting on the ground was done by local militias. And at the time, uh, there was a feeling that this was the new kind of warfare the Western states would, would be doing, because they would have local allies who would, who would do the fighting and, and, and sorting out, and they would be back, backed up by, 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 military, by superior military force. Um, and that's what's called the light military footprint, because the military itself um, would not be really big in the country. It, it wouldn't be a, a, an invasion. There wouldn't be many ground troops um, and all that. So that's what the plan was. At the same time, this was matched by uh, the light footprint um, con concerning the civilian component of the intervention, which was what the United Nations run and, 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 and several state agencies and, of course, non-governmental organizations who were in the country. Um, and the idea was to, to have a, a very light footprint um, as Lakda Brahimi, who was the, the UN uh, special representative at that time, um, put it, meaning that the, it was only some people, some foreigners in the country leading the process and showing the direction, but the process itself um, would be, they, weren't, they, they were not supposed to lead the process, sorry about that. Um, they were um, supposed to show the way, but it was actually meant to be led by Afghans. Um, the, the political agreement that led to the state building was the Petersburg process because it was ag agreed upon on the, in, in Germany, near Bonn, um, where Mike was working. Um, see, there you go. So, um, you probably know a lot more about that than I do. <laughs> um, the Petersburg process um, was an agreement be between several groups, exiled groups, um, Afghan groups, um, and it was kind of a roadmap um, which said we, we are going to do a, a lawyer chirga to, to agree on how to proceed from there and to legitimize the interim presidency. Then we're going to have a lawyer chirga that's, that's adopting a constitution. After the constitution, we'll have elections, and that means we have a state. Um, and that's basically what, what happened. But the, one of the big problems about that was um, 
it wasn't really a peace treaty because a peace treaty would include all sides um, of the of the war and of the conflict. Um, but in that in that case, it was basically a winner's contract because. Um, First of all, it wasn't really clear if everyone was included. What is for sure is that the Taliban weren't included, who turned out to be the biggest opponent to the whole state-building endeavor. Um, so with the state itself not being able to have revenues and to create them, um, and little to no capacity to create, to collect the revenues um, anytime soon. Um, the whole state building was, was forced to rely on foreign funding. All the money that went into the state um, uh, was basically coming from outside. Um, we're talking about a percentage of, I think, 3% in the, in the first year and 5% later. Um, we are now at 30%, but it still means that probably more, more than two-thirds come from, from outside. Um, the funding was focused basically on two areas, um, on the security sector, and still is. It, it's in, increasingly um, focused on the security sector. As you all know, um, there's a lot of training and uh, building up of structures and, 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 and corps and, and, and brigades in the Afghan army going on. Um, and a lot of money goes into that, uh, including armaments for the for the government army. Um, the other the other part where a lot of money went in is is aid, um, as I would say, as I would argue, as opposed to development, um, because a lot of that was based on humanitarian considerations, um, and that means that it's. It's, it's quite good to do that, but at the same time, it's, it's not sustainable in a sense that it starts creating um, a productive cycle and that it, it starts creating revenue for the state, which is what I'm looking at. Um, also, the fact that a highly specialized aid industry came to Afghanistan um, to overtake that whole aid sector um, led to a bypassing of government structures. You have all these international agencies who in many cases have been to Bosnia before, um, or other cases um, in Africa. And then they go to Afghanistan and, and they do what they do best. Um, but they don't really know if that is the best for the circumstances they're, they're actually in. So you don't really know if what's good for Bosnia is good for Afghanistan later on. Um, at the same time, they, were, they didn't want to interfere with the state or they didn't want to be interfered with by the state. Um, so a lot of the funds that went into bypass the Afghan government structures, um, which as you can imagine doesn't really empower the government structures because it's actually not, not part of the whole reconstruction or rather construction um, business. Um, the reason for that, given to me in, in many talks to NGO people and, and, and international uh, organizations people, is that they say that the Afghan government is simply lacking the capacity to steer um, and to, to, to validly um, influence and, and plan. Um, later on, in, after a couple of years, corruption and mismanagement was, was being named as the, the, the biggest hindrances because, as you probably all read in the papers, corruption is one of the big issues now we're talking about in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm coming back to the corruption issue later on um, because it's co connected to the Rantier state theme. Um, from my perspective, the efforts to increase the revenue creation um, aren't really big in Afghanistan. We are now slowly and surely catching up and understanding that it is important um, the, the political economic, politic, political economic um, structure are important for the states, um, but for lack of knowledge how to actually get rid of the foreign funding, um, there's not much going on in that direction. We just talked about that before. Um, there are certain sectors, especially um, import, um, which probably create more revenues now, which, which um, amounts to the increase that, that I've mentioned in, in, in domestic um, revenue creation. 
um, or collection. Um, but still, most of the programs that are run internationally are also still funded internationally. So what's happened was that institutions were seen as beneficial per se, which means that we were assuming that once we have state institutions, they would do, it, do their bit and then everything would go in the right direction. Um, at the same time, it was kind of o overlooked that probably with the state being a source of funding for different groups, it was really interesting for power holders um, to get into the state and try and catch some of the part of the state because it opened funds for them. Um, so we have all these different institutions which aren't run impartially for the public good, but rather they are run for the private good of those who are in office. Um, and that's something that we still haven't sorted out as far as I can see. Um, and it means that the, start, the state was largely captured by the already powerful. It, wasn't really, it didn't really serve to empower the population as, as the intervention intended. Um, also, the capacity to collect money, mainly, um, is still with local power holders. One of the big examples a couple of years back was Ismail Khan in, in, in Herat, um, who failed to turn um, the bigger share of the money that he collected from the trade with Iran um, to the Karzai government, and they started, they actually removed him from the post of governor of Herat. Um, but as the social structures are, um, they replaced him with someone else, but in fact he's still the most powerful man in Herat province, and he's basically running it as far as I can see. Um, at the same time, to kind of calm him down, they got him into, into government, so now he's minister in the government as well. Um, so that's not really getting rid of him. Um, and I don't really know of any other, um, any other incidents of, of, of that um, scale that someone was really removed by the central government. Do you know of, of any, any more? It's probably the, the only one, and, and, and after that it never worked like that, so, okay. So what I'm, what I'm arguing is that there's a lot of bargaining going, going around um, between the central government um, and the local power holders because um, on the one hand, the central government is actually um, entitled to all, all the collections that they make, but the, at the same time, the guys who actually collect it have a lot of bargaining power vis-a-vis um, -vis the government. So um, still we are talking about quite a a small share of what the state actually gets. Um, and, but that basically leads to what, what I've put here as the, to see the state as a, a, a contested space. Because the state is not a, a, a unitary actor where you have everybody you know, knows the direction it's going, but there's a lot of power meddling going on within the state structures itself. So we have to be aware that it's not a, a single unity that we are talking about. Um, moving on to the rents, um, the rent, we, we can see the rent, or is, the rent is usually defined um, as an income which is not a profit. Um, the profit um, stems from a circle of investment and production and reinvestment. Um, so if you invest something and produce something with that investment, um, you have you gain some profit, and then you have to take a large share of that profit to reinvest it to keep the productive cycle going. Um, for the rent, that is not the case. Um, the 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 big um, the 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 idea stems from the oil rentiers in the Middle East, um, because if you have a oil an oil well, and once it's it's if, if once you have the, the infrastructure to act, actually get the oil out of the well and to, tran to transport it somewhere, um, there's no more investment needed. I mean, you have to invest into keeping up the machinery and all that kind of stuff, but compared to the profits, um, that investment is really, really, really small. Um, and the Rantier theory actually argues that this is part of the reason why we have a lot of authoritarian regimes um, in the Middle East um, because if this kind of money generating scheme 
connect to, to political power holders, there's not much reason for them um, to interact with the population because usually the idea is we have taxation and taxation kind of constitutes um, some sort of responsibility and responsivity. Um, because if you as the taxpayer say, I'm not, I'm not convinced of what the government does, the government has a big problem. Probably not, all of, not, not you, but probably you and some more people. So if there's a, a, a big majority and, or a, a huge group within um, a state that's actually voicing dissent, um, then the taxes are quite a quite quite a in good instrument to influence um, the state. Um, okay, we can actually distinguish between three types of rents. The first that I explained regarding the oil rent is is the economic rent, obviously, because you have a good. It's scarce. It's traded internationally, and um, so you have external money flowing in. Um, there. It could be an oil rent, it could be a diamond rent, it could be um, some precious woods, um, all that kind of stuff that is scarce and, and cannot be produced somewhere, somewhere else. Um, at the same time, what we are going to talk about quite a bit right now is the political rent, um, that is rents that are, that are being paid for political reasons. Um, the obvious historical case um, is the Palestinian um, PLO, because many of the Arab states actually um, took a share of their oil rent to pay it to the Palestinians because they kind of felt guilty and they were the Ar Arab brothers. Um, they, they meant to help, so that's, that's probably where, where that comes from. And at the same time, the Palestinian case was um, interesting for the third um, kind of category, that is the migration rents. If you have a lot of people working in a different country um, and they earn enough money to save some, they send back a lot of that. And we have that in, in, in Africa a lot. We have that in Afghanistan, obviously. Um, why it is not important? It, it is important economically. It's not that important politically because it's spread out to different um, people. It's spread out widely. And that's the difference to the political rent because the political rent can actually be monopolized by, by an elite. Um, and, and that's what, what, what makes it politically significant because it kind of focuses the power um, in the hands of a couple of people. Um, right. The, the idea of if you have a, a, a group that monop monopolized the rent, um, the, the rent recipients, um, they develop an interest to stabilize the rent flow. Um, for obvious reasons, they need to make sure that they are there tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Um, so they want to, to, to have good relations with those um, giving them the money with the donors. Um, and that's something that we can observe in Afghanistan because we, because we have this um, affluent Western trade, trained English speaking community um, interacting with the international community a lot and they kind of cut off many of the communication channels with the normal population, um, so to speak. Um, as you can see, I've, I've put down some numbers. It's always really hard to measure that because we don't really know. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of solid accounting and then it, it depends how you count. But we have about, we had about 15% of domestic revenue. Um, we now are up to 28%, but that's really new data, and I haven't really confirmed that yet. It is obviously rising, it's increasing, but it's still um, lower than uh, 30%, um, which means that 70% comes from elsewhere. Um, and the, the Rontier discussion in literature actually says that there's a lot of arguing going on, what, when is it a Rontier state? But the, the, the highest number is about 40%. So if we're at 70% in Afghanistan, we are well beyond that. So it's definitely a, a state that lives off the rent that's coming in. The influence, interestingly, and counterintuitively, actually, um, is that the influence by states, by the states who, who provide the funds is really limited. Um, even though the state needs to have good relations to the donors, um, there's little the donors can do. They can actually say, we're not going to pay you anymore, but they paid for a reason. They don't pay just 
you know, out of, out of a whim. So um, in this case, we are talking about security concerns. Um, and the threat or the idea of the risk of Afghanistan becoming a safe haven for terrorists again is something that kept the international donors from cutting down on, on the funds that are channeling to Afghanistan. Um, this means that the state becomes a source of income. If you have a rentier state, you have a group of people collecting the money, and then from there the money goes to different projects, to different um, provinces, to different sectors of the economy. Um, so it is actually interesting for groups within Afghanistan to become part of the state and to have themselves good relations with the Afghan state because the Afghan state is a source of, source, source of income. As opposed to, as I said, taxation, actually the population pays the state. In this case, it is the state paying the population. Um, Now, what's happening is, in Afghanistan, we, can, we, we have seen, um, as I said, probably the most, we see the most centralized state in the world. Um, and this centralization, you saw the picture, you have Karzai as the head of the state, and from there it goes downwards, and, and, and you have a lot of vertical structures, but you have little, little horizontal structures where you interact and where even ministries don't talk to each other. Um, because that would kind of limit their power. It would give someone else influence. So it's always a superior um, giving orders downwards, and you, you have all these, these, these relations that go up um, in the hierarchy or down. Um, this centralization of the fosters a clientelist network, um, and we can see that in the Afghan um, constitution and also in the Afghan prax practice, that Karzai as the president is probably would be, it's not a problem of the person of Karzai because any president would have to do it in that um, constitution. He appoints most of the people in different offices. Government uh, uh, governance in, in, in provinces is, is done by that. Um, councils that oversee government um, activity are appointed by the president um, and all that. So he has a lot of power in relation to persons. So it's a, it's a, it's a real client-agent client uh, kind of network. Mm. At the same time, in, in, this leads to a buy-in into profitable sectors because it becomes interesting um, to, to invest, so to speak, um, into good relations with state agents to be appointed into one of those offices. Um, so now if we talk about corruption, that's where the corruption actually starts because people buy their jobs um, and then the jobs are run like an economic enterprise because the investment being made into getting the job um, need to pay back at some point. So if you're in a higher rank, um, you collect money from people who want posts in the lower ranks. So it becomes a, a whole pyramid of, of personal and, and economic relations um, there. Um, now, some economists argue that this kind of corruption or even the, the, the corruption on the streets when, when police officers um, collect money from, from people they stop on the streets, um, that you can, could look at this as a form of taxation actually because it's, it's, it's state authorities, authority that um, enables it and you have state people working for the state collecting it, even though they're not pooling it in, in some kind of budget, but they're collecting it for themselves. Um, so there's a discussion going on like that as well, around that as well. Um, but the problem which I want to point, point out is that even though it's a kind of a part of, it's a kind of taxation, what is important is that it doesn't constitute any kind of responsibility or responsivity, um, because the state doesn't respond to the needs of the population. Um, in many cases, um, the state agencies in Kabul don't even know um, what, what, what people want, and they have no institutionalized channels to find out. Um, obviously, the state is not, and, and that's part of our, our Western um, political constitutions, um, the state, in our thinking, ought not to be involved in production and in, 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 in any kind of state enterprise. So the state's um, role as 
an actor in development is pretty limited. Now, if we move away from the state um, and look at the, at the drugs, we're talking about opium in, a, in the case of Afghanistan, we can see that it's actually a few families who are gaining the most in this regard. Um, you might have read that the drug economy is quite big because it, it involves so many Afghans um, and that is mainly the farmers. It's a, a highly work-intensive um, uh, endeavor to grow the, the opium poppy, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, about the traders, and the traders are, the, are those who make the biggest profit, and for them, the supply from the farmers is a pretty steady one. Um, there's shifts in provinces. There's so, some provinces where there's um, poppy grown in one year, but not in another. But still, the, 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 on the whole, the production is quite, it's, it's quite stable. Um, you have, a, you have a, a group, and my information is from people working in UNODC that it's about 20 to 30 families who, who control it, basically. And those are the ones who, who gain the most and who have the biggest rent um, and collect it. And they're cooperating with the Western intervention because they're powerful and, and they're running militias at the same time. Um, and the especially the US, but also others, um, cooperate with the local power holders. So it's actually not, it's, it's really hard to, to, to make a clear distinction between what is, what is opium economy and what is real, uh, real and licit um, economy. Um, coming to that later on. Um, but at the same time, they're cooperating with the government um, wherever they think it's feasible for their profits. And they're at the same time cooperating with the Taliban if they, if they think it's feasible. Um, so it's not really clear um, who's helping whom and if there's a clear political pattern from that. Obviously, that when I say Taliban, that includes a whole range of different violent groups and different militias of a different ideological background. It's not, again, just like the state. It's a contested space. Taliban is quite contested in themselves, too. So... My argument is that the Taliban profits from the opium economy are quite overrated. It's not that the Taliban get the main share of their funding from the opium economy. Um, and I think it's, it, as far as I can see, there's a, a, we're moving away from eradication because the, it's, it's, not, it's being seen as part of the bigger governance problem uh, rather than something that could be solved in itself and everything else derives from that. Um, what we can see is that there's little in reinvestment for, for the trading family, so that's, that's how it constitutes a rent. There's not much reinvestment that needs to be done. Um, and what, what, I've, what I failed to mention is that um, a lot of the money that usually by collecting a rent, the money as it doesn't need re reinvestment, um, is there for consumption. It's free. It can be freely spent for different things. So in the case of the drug economy, a lot of the money goes to the United Arab Emirates or Switzerland or whatever. Um, but at the same time, a part of it is used to buy into product, to invest in productive sectors, to invest, for example, um, in import-export businesses but also, as I mentioned before, to buy into government posts. So we can see a, a, a gradual entanglement between the drug economy and the state. Um, so some people argue that it's, it's, de it's a, a developing narco state. Um, I don't really see that because that means that the state is mainly run in the interest and by the drug economy. Um, I can't really see that in Afghanistan yet, um, but there's obviously some, some interaction of those spheres. Now, if we look at the political consequences, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the rent lowers the political contact to the population. Um, the, where are we? Um, the powerful, well-organized, or urban classes, urban strata of the population um, who are close to the state are quite able to tap into those state funds. Um, but that means you have to have a, a, some kind of political organization to be um, able to do that. Um, 
At the same time, it means um, the further away you are ge geographically or politically, the less able you are to actually get into contact with the government people and get close to the funding. Um, so there's quite a distinction between one strata of the population able and affluent and, 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 and in a position to, to get into that kind of rent generating scheme and others who are geographically distant, um, who are unable to mobilize politically, to, to group and gather, um, or who have little violent potential, obviously violent potential, um, as we can see with all the, with the warlords who are part of the government, um, is quite a good incentive to, to become part of, the, um, to become part of the, the government funding scheme. Um, as I mentioned, the security concerns on the western side um, are being used for pressuring, pressuring for more funds. Um, I don't know if you shared that experience, but my experience is that um, if, if you speak to people in Kabul, they will always tell you, uh, we need more funds, otherwise you'll have terrorists in your country again. Um, and that's, it's, it's odd how often this is repeated. And I came, to, I came to believe that it must be part of some kind of rent generating theme. The whole narrative about the terrorist threat um, becomes an instrument to make sure that rent is flowing in the future too. Um, so I'm not saying that this is, you know, consciously in that direction, but the whole rent structure actually fosters it. Um, we have this kind of, this relates to a de facto privatization of the state by a small clique, a, a small elite, um, which is um, able to immunize from external influence, which means the, the donors. Um, at the same time, um, it is immunizing itself from below and from ab above. So the above is the donors from, from, from outside, um, and the the pop public and population and, and economic entrepreneurs in, in, a, in a real productive cycle are not able to get funds and support from the state because the funds are rather used for um, dealing with people one knows and people who are part of the clientelist network. That in fact leads to a depoliticization of politics. Um, because it's all about economic relations and less about what is being done politically. There's no, I wouldn't say no, but there's little um, exchange about what the money could be used for. Um, there's obviously no or little incentive to foster development um, or to, to create jobs and, and the like um, by using funds and putting, in, putting them into this kind of sector. Um, because, as I said, the empowered strata could become politically influential and, um, no, because you have certain groups that um, the funds are used for better to make sure to stay in power, but at the same time, from a rentier group, it is, it is problematic if um, an, a newly economically empowered group um, starts to reclaim influence. If they say, okay, now we're we are earning money and, and, and we want a share in the state, that's probably breaking up the, the, the running elite and that's what they try to, um, to not allow. Um, we were just talking about that too. The focus on the security sector um, lacks any sustainability because we're building up with external funds a big army, we are building up a big police sector, and now if NATO and the, the Western donors just withdraw after a couple of years because domestic political support um, doesn't allow for, for that amount of spending in Afghanistan, facing an economic crisis in the Western countries, for example, um, then who's gonna pay for it? You have a, a whole sector of a lot of people and they want to feed their families and they probably build a house or whatever they do, with the money and then they run out of funds. So what, what is it they're going to do? They do what they do best, best and that's in military terms, um, that's um, somewhere in the, in the violent sector. Um, so, and at the same time, the Af Afghan history provides a couple of examples where um, a lowering of the rent um, actually led to more and violent competition for the rent, uh, for the funds that are there. 
Um, and that's something that I want to bring your attention to because that's a dangerous ground we are moving on just now. Um, and as it looks with a draining out um, involvement in Afghanistan, um, probably we are creating unsustainable structures which might lead to uh, violent eruptions later on. Uh, my conclusion is that the Western Ronti State Building um, is counterproductive um, regarding the intervention's aims, which was building uh, a stable state, but it's a really dependent state just now. It's not really a stable, self-sustaining state. Um, the structure limits is what, what I and a colleague of mine were just writing a book um, about that, and we call it Potemkin statehood. I, I don't know if you're um, familiar with the, Potemkin was a, a Russian general um, who built, um, it, it relates to the Crimean War, um, and they built um, huge structures which were basically facades, and there were no buildings behind the facade, and he did that to impress um, um, Katharina, um, the, the, the Tsar. And the thing is that uh, we are, Afghanistan is something close to that, because we have Afghanistan, we have a head of state, Afghanistan has a seat in the United Nations, they have ambassadors in all the Western capitals, um, but at the same time, the, the, the structure behind the facade in which society relates to who, who, are go who is governing them, um, that's missing. And that's, that's the, the, one of the big problems that state building endeavors usually um, fail, fail to tackle in the first place. And also, if they do, they fail to establish these kind of structures because they kind of need to, re to build from, from within. Um, we have seen a change of strategy recently after Obama um, took office, um, what, what I termed COIN here, which is counterinsurgency in, in military terms. Um, COIN is moving away from attacking the terrorists or the insurgents um, and moving towards protecting the population. Um, the idea behind that is that you get some, you open some political space and allow for the political uh, dynamics to play out without being driven by the violence that's going on all the time. Um, at the moment, I don't really see what the political strategy is behind that and what should fill this political room that is being created. Um, I'm, there's still a lot of meddling going on and I don't really see which direction it's going to take. That's maybe something that we could discuss later on. Um, the intervention, I would argue, um, in the first place, um, resulted in taking on Kasai colonial responsibilities um, that the Western states were reluctant to take on. Um, by saying we have a light footprint um, and putting the responsibility for Western security on a new Afghan government, um, many of the responsibilities weren't really lived up to. Um, and at the same time, and that's where I'm going to end, um, what's left and what's going to be left if the Western involvement is being downscaled um, and eventually, I'm, I don't really see it's a, it's a stay in Afghanistan or leave Afghanistan binary kind of decision because there's a lot of different uh, possibilities in between, um, but we have to be aware that we are part of the state structure and part of the rentier scheme that we have in Afghanistan. Um, just to illustrate, I have doesn't really illustrate much, just to give you an impression. Um, we have a big involvement of, of Western military, which is um, a big economic sector itself, because there's a lot of um, supportive industry and supportive trade going on. Um, then we still have fragmented and, um, from a human rights perspective, highly problematic societal structures. Um, you see. Ladies in the burqa in Herat here. And then we have a lot of large scale trade going on, but it's not generating a lot of revenue because it's basically um, coping strategies rather than um, real production. And then we have, that's just, um, it's on another note actually, because I'm sometimes I'm part of my, my presentation is how overcrowded Kabul actually is. You probably experienced that as well. Um, 
you're not really able to move a lot on the streets because they're quite packed um, and you have all these. Um, it was a town of about um, a million inhabitants before the Taliban, then it dropped sharply to about 500,000, and now it's up to maybe 3 million as far as I heard, but obviously nobody has real numbers, um, but it's quite overcrowded, and that's going to lead to another problem, which I'm not going to be talking about, that's um, the, the water problem and sewage. Okay, so now there's, that's that, and then we are back in here, and that's me, and Thanks, and I'm taking your questions. <laughs> okay. So, Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, I was just wondering, what is a potential economic alternative other than uh, foreign aid and drugs for economic growth in Afghanistan? Uh, do you have any potential avenues that they can take on that front? Um, I wouldn't say alternative, because alternative would mean that, um, that Ranchi's scheme actually is productive, and it is not. It's, it's not fostering development in, in, a, in a sense of growth. I mean, we could debate if development is all, has to be growth, but basically that's what we're talking about. Um, I'm, I, ha I don't have a ready-made economic plan for Afghanistan, but what I'm trying to do is to, to, to hint and, and show how important it is to involve the state building and connect it to the economic sector more than the Western intervention based on its liberal thinking, um, where you have a, a two distinct spheres of political, the, the political and the economic. And it's not that distinct, in fact. Um, so my argument would be that we have to involve the state more um, into really st state-run state companies and all that kind of stuff, which generates um, jobs and which generates um, income for people. Um, and it, it doesn't really help to put a lot of, we are talking about a lot about how people are happy with their lives and, and if, if they're not, then they become terrorists. Even, even that is highly debatable. Um, but it's, it's, it's not an, an aid scheme that people will make a living of because people want to, to plan, they want security, they want to have a perspective of a couple of years and that is something that can only be done by, by, by production. Um, and my argument would be we, we, we definitely have to involve the state into that kind of productive schemes and get the state um, to, to be part of that, even though in Western countries um, that is kind of a, a no-go. We, we don't want state involvement in, in, in the private sector. Um, but that's a different situation. I know that the World Bank has done some terrific work um, with their micro loans uh, in different countries in the world, and I would think that, you know, those most of those loans were a hundred or two hundred dollars, and when you think of it, a million people could be given loans for two hundred million dollars, which would be a small amount of money compared to what's already going into trying to sustain the state. So, what do you see as that, rather than? state enterprises of focusing on those types of micro loans uh, to encourage a market economy? Um, that's certainly, um, certainly part of an economic scheme that would be beneficial. Um, I'm not saying the state should run the economy in itself, but it, it should, you know, my argument before was it should get more involved. At the same time, micro loans, microfinance is a, it's, it's a good way um, to, to, to get into that. But um, microloans have been widely discussed in, in the last couple of years. Um, and in many times it sounded like the solution to all problems, and that's where I get skeptical. Um, and I'm not really an expert on microloans, so I, I, can't, I, I can't just recount my impression. I, my impression is or from data that I read 
um, that many private institutions now get into the business of microloans. It's not only the World Bank anymore, but it's, 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 it's private entrepreneurs. And I don't really know if that's a good or a bad thing. I, I'm not totally against, I'm not against private entrepreneurship, not at all. Um, but it seems that there is, I, it's, I'm, it's just a suspicion. I don't really know. It's certainly a part of a, an economic scheme and it's important, but at the same time, it is not, um, it's, it's not financing a lot of big growth, um, factories and all that kind of stuff. So, and we need that as well. Um, so we need to balance it on a, on a, on a small scale with microloans, but we need um, a banking sector or international loans for bigger investments too. And one of my, one of my examples usually is, which I found was a brilliant idea, because in Afghanistan, as in most of Central Asia, in fact, um, people drink a lot of tea and they use a lot of sugar. Um, and now all the sugar that is uh, consumed in Afghanistan is being imported. Um, so there was a sugar factory um, in, in Bahlan, um and there was not that big an investment. I think it was about $4 million or something. And they rebuilt the, the factory um, and they got a, a uh, agricultural scheme going so that they were actually um, building the plants the sugar would be made from and that was all running and then it was then it should be when it was when it should be opened it was one of the biggest attacks that the Taliban staged um, and they attacked it and I don't know what the state is just now but I fig but I figure that um, usually it's hard to get that amount of money um, again to invest in that kind of, of, of um, practice what I'm trying to say with that is that is something that would really generate something within Afghanistan for Afghanistan because it would be produced in Afghanistan uh, and also it would be consumed in Afghanistan. So that would have a lot of spin-off effects because the money would be in the circle. At the same time, obviously, the Taliban um, found, didn't think it was that a good idea themselves and that's why they targeted it. Um, so still, apart from what I was saying in the, in the talk, um, security is still a big problem. Um, but ba basically, that's the road we should we should go to. Well, just follow up on that because I think you know we often run into problems where we think we can pick the winners, and it sounds to me as though what you're suggesting is that either international organizations and experts or or people within the government in Afghanistan should now be trying to pick the winners and make big investments in those industries, and. Um, I think with the current state of the Afghan government and infrastructure, that could be disastrous. And so for me, it's rather like the Tea Party, the original Tea Party. Mm -hmm. Right now there is um, taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. And I think if you um, encourage that at a grassroots level, uh, those kinds of investments, certainly for our own economy and for, for most Western economies, most of the growth is generated with small businesses and that then grow and, and become larger businesses over time. And it certainly empowers the people in the country. You're absolutely right. Um, that, that's why I think that many in the, in the state class don't like that um, because that would threaten their, their monopoly on power. Um, at the same time, um, I, I would stress that it must be a mixture. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we, we, we don't need bigger investments or, or more focused investments on industries where the industry have a real perspective to become part of the, of the local economy rather than uh, being ex ex exportive um, in, in its focus. Um, at the same time, I, I, told, I couldn't agree more. I was hoping you could touch on um, the role of Western governments, not just through foreign aid, uh, but also as consumers in the economy, um, and what the, what the effect might be of the uh, international withdrawal uh, on uh, areas like construction. I remember reading a, an article, I think it was in Time magazine, about the restaurant scene in Kabul, that there were hundreds of nice restaurants there because of contractors who have, <laughs> sure. <laughs> But, but what might be the effect on the economy when the uh, withdrawal occurs? Uh, yeah, very, very, very good, very valid point. Um, there is a whole lot of 
uh, what I could, what I would call the intervention economy. That's I, I tipped on that with, when I said there's a lot of supportive trade going on for the military because they're importing a lot of, and the, especially the um, the trucks and and the the, the transportation economy is um, living of that to quite an extent. Um, certainly, for a, for okay, now I have to be careful. It's not. Um, Afghanistan itself, that would be really hardly hit. It would be Kabul that would be, cha would be changed totally. Because most of what the international community does is centered in and around Kabul. Um, there's all the offices, there's all the, peop all the Afghans working in those offices, um, there's all the experts, and there's all where, where the money usually goes. Um, so many Afghans say, if you know Kabul, you don't know Afghanistan because it's quite different, and you probably agree um, that there is huge differences between Kabul and now going into history. Always were well, not always, but for the last couple of probably a couple of dozen, year, dozen years, um, Kabul was quite different, and that's part of the conflict that we have between the urbanized. Um, modernized classes in Kabul and the bigger share of the population that lives outside in the, in the country or in, in I mean it's, it's always the, the cliche of the remote village but um, there is this kind of disconnect between the urban population and, and the, the rural areas um, and my argument would be it's definitely going to hit Kabul it's probably hitting Kandahar and Herat maybe and 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 Kunduz or Masar Sharif, but that's only a handful of of urban centers, and in the rest um, the economic impact wouldn't be that big. Obviously in Kabul the impact would be huge, um, and I think that's that's something that we haven't really thought about um, in depth, and certainly I haven't. But um, I don't really know of any planning um, how that how how we could try to. Um, filter down the effects of a withdrawal in, in that area because it, 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 it would mean you know, to disenfranchise the, the, the starting, starting middle class that's, that's coming up there. If, if um, with all caution of the class terms because that's a, 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 you know, Western sociology that where it derived from. So that's only partly applicable to Afghanistan. Hi, Florian, thanks. I just wanted to push you a little bit on, on one of your, your points, which was this idea of how you say getting the state more involved in the economy. Considering the inefficiency of the Afghan state, some of the corruption that we've seen in the Afghan state, um, what would this look like and how would the international community go about doing this? Secondly, and related to this, one of the things many people would say has been one of the positive things about Afghanistan has been the flowering of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, Afghanistan has its first billion dollar company, Roshan, uh, which has now, I don't know, there's four telecommunications companies, cell phone providers. Um, you know, you can go on to various industries. There's been private security, which has its problems, but there's been various um, uh, uh, significant growth in parts of the private sector, so which would seem to run somewhat contrary to your, your claim that there has to be more of a focus on state-run uh, um, industries to engage the state more in some of these productive uh, processes. So I was wondering if you could address that point. I would also say that, and this is partially a response to one of the earlier questions, which was what would be a, an alternative to uh, drugs or uh, uh, political rents. Uh, I mean, clearly we know from Afghan history that agriculture, we know that Afghanistan is still pr predominantly agrarian rural society. Um, we, we know that in the past, Afghanistan was a net exporter of dried fruits and fruits to its neighbors. One of the main problems right now is that it doesn't have a good, good access to the Indian market because the Pakistanis won't allow transit trade. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it seems to me that there are alternatives out there. There's natural resources that are untapped. They have the largest copper mine in the world, which the Chinese just bought the rights for. Uh, so um, there seems to be some alternatives um, out there. So maybe you could also address that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, good point, and you're totally right, of course. Um, 
the I'm, I wasn't saying that per se the state should overtake the economic sector, um, but what we see at the moment is that um, businesses flourish where they can. That is the security sector and that is the telecommunication sector, um, but it, I think it would be a good idea or I think it would be valuable from a development point um, if the state would step in where it is not productive um, in, in, in a short period, which is interesting for investors. So the state has to have a, a, a more, a longer perspective. And um, I mean, the, rather than building up eight dependen dependency structures that are not sustainable, it might be worthwhile to take the risk to say, okay, it might only pay off in 10 years or something, but until then it creates a lot of jobs. Um, so um, my argument is the, the, the economic um, reasoning is, is, is all well, but in, in, in a case like Afghanistan, there should be more um, political steering and more ideas um, which sectors are not interesting to the private sector, um, and then the state might go in, 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 in that direction. Being aware, having talked about the state raunchy structures, that this is not going to be easy and that this is not going to be something that you know just pops up and everybody knows this is what we're going to do and there's not going to be agreement and there's people trying to influence to get those projects to their con to, to their part of the country rather than to another one and all that and um, it's it's a it's a just to 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 raise awareness um, without having an empirical or or um, you know a recommendation how to put it to to implement it on the ground um, so um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Say, Such a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a, a token of oh, wow. CG's thanks. So oh, here you go. Great. All Thanks right. a lot. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>